I am so sorry about that. I, you know, everybody's always waiting for me to forget something. It's so funny when Sarah forgets something. Well, I forgot to turn on the mic. Oh. Okay, so this is what you missed. I put in, I put in first seven egg yolks. I separated them before the video. So I have oaks and I, yolks and I have eggs in a different container. I added a cup of sugar to that and I mixed it all up really well. And then to that, I added five cups of whole milk. So that's what we've got in here right now. Now what I'm doing is I put a half a cup of heavy cream in this mixing tin. I have the spring from a strainer in the tin and I'm shaking it up to lightly whip the cream. This is a bartender's trick. So um, if somebody comes into my bar and orders like an Irish coffee, for example, this is what I do to make fresh cream to put on the drink. So I'm just gonna whip it until I feel it start to start to firm up in there. All right, who's here? Hi, Bill. Hi, Jeremy. Hi, Grace. Thank you, everybody, for watching. I hope that you can hear now. Okay, I, I'm feeling it start to get firm. I can just feel that the that the spring is having a slightly harder time. Um, moving around in the tin. So I'm going to open it up and you can see it's still a little runny but it's thick. It's coated the sides really well and it has, has some uh, stiffness to it. All right so I'm going to put this in with the batter. The reason why you want to whip the heavy cream a little bit is because you want the texture that comes when you when you whip the cream you're putting air into it and you want that air in your eggnog it adds texture to the eggnog if you don't whip your cream and if you don't beat your egg whites which we'll do in a minute then your eggnog will be a little thin okay here's the rest of the cream <laughs> I really, truly love the look of, of heavy cream. <laughs> All right, now I'm gonna mix this in again, just a little bit. I don't want to, I don't want to um, mix it, it's too much. Okay. Oh good, Jeremy, thank you for letting me know that you can hear me. Appreciate it. All right, now next, I'm gonna beat these egg whites. I beat them a little bit ahead of time, so I wouldn't have too much work to do now. But again, the whole reason that you wanna beat the egg whites is just because it's gonna add to the texture of your eggnog. All right, there we go. They're, they're frothing up for me there. Beautiful. Okay. Now again, I'm going to mix these in, but just lightly. I'm not going to stir it too much. Okay. And a very important ingredient in eggnog is nutmeg. So nutmeg is what eggnog tastes like. So I'm putting a full teaspoon of nutmeg in this recipe. When you get that store, that pre-made store stuff, which, I mean, I'm not gonna lie, I do once in a while, it's not as good as the homemade stuff. But when you get that and you see all the little flecks that are floating around in it, that is nutmeg. Okay, so I'm gonna stir this in a little. Like this, the eggnog is delicious. And a non-alcoholic drink that you can serve to anybody who doesn't want booze or 
is a child, perhaps? But we're gonna now add the booze. So first, I have a Jamaican rum. And again, this is what was called for in the original Poe family recipe from 1790. Poe's family recipe. So Jamaican rum. This particular rum is actually a blend of Jamaican and Guyanan rums. Um, it's Hamilton. It's higher proof. It is really, it's, it's fantastic stuff. Um, I am putting in a quarter of a cup. There we go. And now I'm going to add a cup and a half of brandy. In this instance, I am using a cognac. Cognac, of course, is brandy just from a specific region, the cognac region in France. So this is Pierre Ferrand, 1840. This is my favorite cognac, my favorite brandy really to use in cocktails in general. The reason they call it 1840 is because it is a recreation to the best of their estimation of what a cognac from 1840 would have been like, which makes it really appropriate for this recipe. Um, the Hamilton rum is also close to what some of the rum would have been like that they were getting back then. It's big, it's funky, it's high proof. So it's a cup and a half. I happen to know that there's a cup and a half in this bottle, so I'm just going to dump it right in. There we go. All right, let's, let's mix it all together. Beautiful. All right, now I'm going to scoop it into my cup. Oh, I'm making a mess. Okay, now important last step before you drink this or before you serve it to somebody is to put some nutmeg on top. Hold on a second, I'm going to get rid of this big bowl. Okay. Ooh. All right, so normally what I would do is I would have a, a whole nutmeg and I would actually just grate some fresh nutmeg right on top of this eggnog. They didn't have any whole nutmegs at the store when I went, so I'm using the second best, um, which is this, this little guy right here. <laughs> that way the smell of the nutmeg is going to be the first thing that hits your nose. Even though there's a ton of it in the recipe, sometimes drinks with egg in them can have a slightly sulfurous smell. They don't have a taste, but they have the smell. So it's really nice to have something on top of them that will completely cover up that smell. So that's the function of that nutmeg. <laughs> I love nutmeg, um, eggnog. Ooh, I love it so much. This is fan friggin tastic. Ooh, all right. So Edgar Allan Poe, his life was tragic, tragic from, from starting at a very young age. When he was two years old, well, I should say he was born in 1809 in Boston on January 19th, and he lived his whole life up and down the East Coast. He was indispensable to the development of the horror genre, and he was actually my introduction to horror. When I was about eight years old, my dad um, was reading me Edgar Allan Poe. My dad introduced Edgar Allan Poe to me at bedtime, but that gave me a lifelong love of 
horror and perhaps poetry too, because it was my introduction to poetry as well. So Edgar Allan Poe, very important man. So when he was two, just two years old, his mother died. Uh, she died of what was then called tuberculosis, or what was then called consumption, what we now call tuberculosis. Um, then when he was 15 years old, the first love of his life died. She died of probably brain cancer. After his mother had died, his father had already abandoned the family. Him, his brother, and his, his sister were all split up and went to live with different families. The family that he lived with, the Allen family, um, included his foster mother, who he became very attached to, and she to him. They were very, very close to one another. When he was 20, his foster mother died. She died of a long-wasting illness. And then just two years later, when he was 22, his brother died of the same disease that his mom had. He died of tuberculosis. Poe went to live after that with his aunt and his cousin, Virginia. After a couple of years of marrying, of living with them, when Virginia was 13 years old, Poe's cousin, Virginia, he married her. He was 27 years old. Virginia, his cousin, was 13. It's a little unsavory to say the least. Now, there is speculation that their relationship was not so much um, romantic in the sense of a man and a woman, not so much physical. They never had any children. Um, it may have been more of a sibling relationship, but they still got married. And that is, that is only speculation. Who knows what was really going on? They were certainly in the same room together. So I find marrying a 13 year old under any circumstances to be highly objectionable. But nonetheless, Edgar loved Virginia deeply deeply. A few years after they were married, five years after, when she was 18 years old, she was playing the piano and singing for them in their home. She started coughing and then started bleeding from the mouth. Virginia was now sick with the same illness that had killed Poe's mother and brother. She had consumption or tuberculosis. Five years later, she died from the tuberculosis. The date that she died was also the date of Poe's dead brother's birthday. Virginia was 24 years old when she died, which was the same age that both Poe's mother and his brother were when they died. It's quite a coincidence. A Poe at this point was devastated by the loss of Virginia and he was not long for this world. In fact, a little bit more than two years later, he died in Baltimore. The date was 10-7-1849. The anniversary of his death is actually tomorrow. Now, it is widely supposed that he died of, of drink, that he died of alcohol. He was a famous alcoholic. The problem with that is that it was known at this point that he had been not drinking for a while. He had given it up due to its ill effects on him. There is also speculation that instead of dying of alcohol, he had something done to him that was called being cooped. And this was where unsavory characters looking to stack elections would kidnap men. They would put them in cages that looked like chicken cages and they would feed them alcohol and drugs until they could get them to do whatever they want, wanted. And then they would take them to the polls, have them vote for whoever they wanted 
And then they would dress them in different clothes and take them back to the polls, take them to different polls, get as many votes out of these men as they could until the men were too inebri inebriated to uh, manipulate any further. And then they would leave the men for dead. Poe's body, still living but barely, was found near a polling station where this practice was known to have gone on. So it's possible that that's what happened to him. We will probably never really know. The reason is that his death records, including his death certificate, vanished shortly after his death. Poe had a cat and he loved this cat. It was he and Virginia's constant companion through her illness. She was a tortoise shell cat and her name was Katerina. Now Poe was in Baltimore when he died, which wasn't his home. His home was in New York where his mother-in-law slash aunt still lived with him. So she was at home when she found out about Poe's death in Baltimore. Shortly thereafter, very shortly, like days, she found Katerina dead as well. So this brings us to the other speculation about Poe's death. It is widely thought that Poe died of rabies. And perhaps he got the rabies from Katerina, who then also succumbed to the disease. Again, death records are gone, so we'll never know. It's also possible that Katerina just knew that her people were gone and she didn't want to go on, or it was a coincidence. I prefer to go with the romantic version. During his life, Poe became very famous for his writing. The Raven blew up internationally. He had international fame. But despite this international fame, he was still broke. He rarely ever made more than $15 for a portion of one of his stories or one of his poems. So he never made enough money to get ahead. He also suffered from depression. It was known then that he, that he suffered from uh, this thing, and it is widely accepted now that he really, really was under the thumb of depression. So despite his fame, this man really, uh, he suffered blow after blow through his life. It was very sad. And then, when he passed away in the hospital, shortly after arriving there, some cousins came to claim his body. The cousins buried him in his family plot, but they buried him totally unceremonious, unceremoniously. There were seven or eight people um, at when he was being buried, and they didn't even put down a headstone. Finally, Ten years later, people had raised money to put a monument over his grave. The monument was done and waiting in the store to be picked up and put in place when a train ran into the store and destroyed the monument. So no monument for Edgar. But 15 years later, money was raised for another monument. This one even a bigger and better monument. And the graveyard decided that they were going to put it in a place of honor. They wanted to place the monument inside, right inside the gate, which meant also moving Edgar's body to where the monument was. So they dug up his coffin and they started moving it. The coffin fell apart, fell open, exposing Edgar Allan Poe's remains. People that were watching grabbed pieces of the coffin. One of his fans that was there is rumored to have worn the pieces of the coffin that she grabbed 
in the shape of a crucifix around her neck until the day that she died. Virginia was not buried in the same cemetery. They were in different locations. So a biographer of Poe's decided that they should put, be put together. He went to all the trouble of finding where Virginia was because it was not clear, but he did find her and he was able to get her remains. But he didn't bring them to Poe immediately. No, he put Virginia under his bed. The biographer put Virginia underneath his bed and he left her there for literally years before he finally took her bones and buried them with Poe. So not only did Poe have this really tragic life, but also all of these pretty terrible things happened to him after his death. So it is no wonder that Poe is now known to haunt many places. He is said to haunt the graveyard which is called Westminster Hall and Burying Ground. And he is seen in multiple places around the graveyard. He is also said to be seen in Washington College Hospital. That is the hospital where he died and that lost his death records. I think my favorite is he's seen at Fort Monroe Poe was a soldier when he was young. Um, he was a soldier to make money. So he was stationed at Fort Monroe and he's seen there sitting at a writing desk and writing, which has to be, uh, it just seems like a very happy place for him. He's also seen walking in both Baltimore and Providence on the streets outside of places that he used to live. Poe was known during his life to do quite a bit of walking, even after Virginia died, walking all hours of the night. There's a bar in Baltimore called The Horse You Came In On. Apparently, it's known as The Horse, and it's still in existence. He's also said to haunt that bar. Now, at that bar, Poe is mischievous. When it is denied that he is there, he is said to pull chairs out from, other, from under people. Supposedly, he knocks things on the ground and just generally kind of causes a little bit of trouble in the place. Well, that's it. That is it for Poe's eggnog and Poe's very tragic and spooky life. As always, I am accepting tips on Venmo. It's Sarah L.M. Mangoni. 10% of any tips that I do make on this episode, I will be donating to the Poe Museum in Richmond, Virginia. There are many Poe museums. Um, there's even a Poe house that you can visit. This has the biggest collection of Poe's things. The Poe house, interestingly, my dad went to visit and he told me that they used to have a bust of Poe in the house, but it disappeared at some point. And the staff there was really upset that it was gone, but there wasn't much that they could do, it was gone. And then they found out shortly after that somebody had stolen the bust and taken it to a local bar because they thought that Poe would rather be at the bar than in the museum. And there it sits to this day. So that's pretty cool. All right, I just wanted to close this episode to read a quote from Poe that I really like. Okay, so this quote is regarding Virginia's five-year battle with tuberculosis. Each time I felt all the agonies of her death, and at each accession of the disorder, I loved her more dearly and clung to her life with more desperate pertinacity. But I am constitutionally sensitive. 
nervous in a very unusual degree. I became insane with long intervals of horrible sanity. Edgar Allan Poe. All right, that's it for today. Cheers. See you next week at the next Haunted Historically Drinking.